Hello, everyone. I am Peter Freer. I am the founder and CEO of Play Attention. I have a master's in education, veteran educator of over 16 years. So welcome to the webinar, uh, Making Teaching Fun and Wonderful. So as we proceed through uh, this today, our agenda will be survey info. I have really interesting information that you may or may not have read regarding our lives and getting back to normal. It'll help us understand where we are and how, where we're going. We'll work on uh, dispelling a myth uh, that has been uh, posited to us, I don't know for how many years now. Uh, we'll discuss the aims of education. Important to understand why we're even doing this. Why do we educate uh, kids other than to keep them out of our hair for the first 18 years? Wonderful teaching. What wonderful teaching actually is? Wonder and curiosity. Usable concepts for you to take with you today. A summary, and then we'll do upcoming events as well. So the first part of this is talking about the survey that we have. Let me move my picture so you can read all of this. All right. These are things, Attitude Magazine, great magazine if you don't get it, you can subscribe to it. I have nothing to do with Attitude other than we advertise in there, but uh, they are a fantastic magazine as far as their uh, content is concerned, uh, their ability to set up webinars uh, with uh, experts in this field. Uh, they're, it's a great publication. So they did a survey and uh, more than 3,000 and uh, their pandemic survey. So many of you here may actually uh, feel the same way. When they asked, they said, uh, they have put us in an impossible situation, which means as an adult, I have to work at home, right? I have to uh, not only work, but I also have to be the uh, police at home. I have to be the guidance counselor. I have to be the uh, uh, teacher as well. So I feel like I'm being forced to choose between my child's mental health and his physical health. There is no good option. Do we send them back? Do we know what the schools are going to do? When we look at most of those information, this is what people told Attitude. 71% of, of the people surveyed said that you are feeling anxious or worried, right? And you can put your hand up here uh, and let me just make certain my chat is open so I can see. Um, you can uh, put your hand up here if you feel that way. You can raise your hand and say, that's me. 68% say the risk of COVID is moderate right? High or very high in our area, but 31% are returning to a workplace soon. So there's something that, you know, is a little bit uh, worrisome to all of us, right? We know that there's still a problem out there, but 31% of us are going back to a workplace if we're not already at a workplace. 61% of your schools have not announced a solid plan for the fall. That's probably changed since they've done the survey. Is there anyone here who, uh, feels that they know exactly what's going on? Do you, you raise your hand if you, if you know exactly what's going on and what you're going to do at this point? A few of you are raising your hands for that. How many of you say, I still really don't have any clue what's, you know, I have a little bit of an idea what I'm going to do. Anyone here for that? All right, so we're about 50-50 on that. Wow, okay. Um, and this one is very interesting. And though remote learning was a disaster for the majority of Attitude families, 43% will be facing it again this fall. How many people here felt that uh, remote learning, doing it as the schools were forced to do it last minute, trying to get this curriculum over a computer screen, how many people felt that that was a disaster for you that are here? Yeah, wow, okay. Well, that is a great majority of the folks here. That's interesting because it is difficult to understand, you know, um, how we're all going to do this. And I really want to dispel a myth now. <laughs> we need to disabuse ourselves from the notion 
that computers are teachers. Do you remember years ago? Oh, it's probably 10 years ago. Uh, people were told computers are going to replace teachers. Don't need them. Don't need teachers. We'll just put computers in the classroom. The teacher just walks around and monitors the kids. How many people heard that? Raise your hand if you heard that. I heard it. I thought for a while I would be replaced while I was in the classroom. That we don't really need teachers any longer. We just need computers. Well, that's a myth, isn't it? Because there's something about teaching, <coughs> excuse me, something about teaching that has to do with the contact, right? With the ability to uh, get a message across and the personal communication. Now, even if teachers are trying to communicate across a computer, as I'm doing with you now, obviously it is not the same as if we were in the same room together and talking because there is a great amount of meaning that is shared or conveyed between us when we're face to face. That's why in business, if we have business meetings, typically in the old days before the virus, we would have face to face meetings. They, if I were uh, doing business with uh, California, they would uh, demand that I fly out to Silicon Valley because there is something to face to face uh, and teaching is exactly the same way. So computers, even though the schools are forced now to try to convey lessons over this medium, it's not the same. And I'm certain you, the vast majority of you are aware of it. They are a tool, but they aren't teachers. And for a long time, they won't be. The why again is because there is personal meaning in having the contact uh, with another human being, a teacher. And let's discuss that a little bit, all right? Uh, why is that so important? When we understand what our aims are in education, now aims, the aims of education is not something I contrived, right? The aims of education actually go all the way back to John Dewey, turn of the century, early 1900s. John Dewey was one of the fathers of modern ed education, a psychologist, a philosopher, and he wrote quite a bit on it. He is important to modern education as is Jean Piaget, uh, William James, and so forth. So he said, what are the aims of education? What's the purpose for keeping these kids in school? If we understand this, it's gonna help you become a better teacher at home. Is it just to give them knowledge? Is it to get them to, uh, into a vocation, if that's where their, uh, you know, their predilection lies? Uh, is it just to uh, get them into the culture? Is it for personal uh, uh, development, right? To give them a complete life and character and good values? Or is it to make them a good part of citizenship, right? And in a democracy. What of this, you know, what is the purpose? For me, as an educator, it was about getting them to think and to ponder, to think for themselves, to reason objectively. That was my primary aim whenever I was in the classroom teaching. This was my primary aim. Because if I have this as my primary aim, right, then this all follows. If I can get them to think and reason, then knowledge, vocation, culture, personal development, citizenship, and democracy all fall in line. Is everyone with me? All right? Is this too abstract? If it's too abstract, raise your hand. Or if it makes sense, uh, you know, I, I hope you can follow it. But if it's too abstract, um, I'll, I'll try to re-explain. Remember, if our primary goal is just to give them knowledge, then we could just put them in front of a computer. Right? They can pick up everything they need to know off of Google. Right? So if knowledge is the only reason, it's not enough. If vocation, if I want them to become a welder later in life or um, a mechanic, well, they might be able to get that through a computer as well, taking a few courses on a computer. If it's culture, you could get that 
a little bit uh, from home and from the world surrounding you, uh, personal development. Uh, if that is the primary objective of education, then we've greatly failed here in the United States. Uh, we are so far behind the rest of the world educationally. If you've looked at our ratings from knowledge, vocation, cult culture, and personal development and citizenship democracy, we actually are trailing even third world countries. So the way that education has gone for many years now is uh, a bit of a mess. And I haven't seen it improve at all really over the last uh, oh, 10, 20 years. It's, it's uh, a little bit, uh, and I'm certain you're aware, it's very, very difficult. Education in the States is, is uh, fairly, um, fairly poor at this time. Uh, I'll tell you what happened to me. I'll share this briefly so we can get right into the, uh, the webinar a little bit. When I was teaching uh, my first year, I just could not do what they were asking, the principal was asking me to do. Basically, uh, I was in rural Western North Carolina and uh, the principal was asking me essentially that we use the textbook, uh, we go through the textbook, they answer the questions at the end of the textbook, they sit in chairs all day long, and they take the end of grade test, and that was it. And for me, I couldn't, I couldn't bear it. It was torture. And if it were, if it was torture for me then, I know it was torture for the students. So when my students came to my class, I changed everything. I began to work without the textbook. I had them come to work so that there was meaning to coming to school other than to write things on a piece of paper and throw them out when they got done with them. They had a job. We had a newspaper. We had uh, magazine um, publishing. We had video studio or television studio. We had a NASA-like project. And I'll go through some of these with you uh, in the uh, classroom. We had our own government in the classroom. We had our own money in the classroom and so much more. We even got peer evaluations. Even I, as the teacher, got a peer evaluation from the students. And then we also studied uh, values, how we actually make good uh, decisions, pros and cons, weighing the pros against the cons. It became so successful, it alarmed the uh, principal. So he called me into his office and he had the assistant principal next to me. And uh, he said to me, his first words to me were, I know you're not going to hit me, but I just thought I'd have Mr. Uh, Hanky here with you to uh, make certain we were, you know, gentlemen. And so I knew it wasn't going to be good for me. And uh, he said, so I need you to resign. I need you to resign, take a job over at Scotts Creek Elementary. And I said, I'm not resigning. He said, well, you're not following the curriculum. And I said, yes, I am following the curriculum. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do under North Carolina mandates. He said, you're not using the textbook. The other teachers have reported to me you're not using the textbook. I said, no, we're not using the textbook. He said, well, I need you to resign. And this is, I'm about uh, halfway through the year. He said, I'll get you a job over at that school, but I don't want you here any longer. And I'm not tenured or anything at that point, but uh, I am in for a fight. I don't mind having a good fight. So we're screaming at each other across his desk. And I said, I'm not. You can go ahead and fire me if you wish, and then we'll take it in court. And uh, we're yelling this. Uh, he did not want to go into a court battle with me, so he left me. Here's what happened. The university that I was uh, graduated from, Western Carolina, came in and brought throngs of student teachers in to see the classroom and see how it was working. Uh, they put me in textbooks. I appeared in two different textbooks from in uh, several, uh, two different departments at the university. At the end of the year, on the end of grade test, I had 28 students, 17 of them were in the 99th percentile, the 99th percentile on the end of grade test. The others who were not uh, as fortunate as being in the 99th percentile made at least two years progress over where they had been when they came to my classroom. So what happened? Principal saw me after the test. He said, I guess you saw the tests. The test scores. I said, I guess you saw the test scores. He said, I did. So the parents have come to me and they've asked me that you take them another year. I said, you know, this is so difficult. What I did was so difficult 
And now to go to a brand new curriculum and try to reproduce that is very difficult. And he goes, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. So I did it. And we had an equally successful year the next year. So I know what I'm telling you works. The county actually hired me to teach this to the rest of the teachers in the county. And of course, I became the most wanted person. I think there was a bounty on my head at that because, you know, to ask teachers to change to something that different was not a good thing. Um, but they did. That's how good it actually is. So that's what we'll go over a bit today. All right. I hope that uh, was not too long a digression from what we're talking about, but it'll give you a sense of what you are going to be able to do. All right. Wonderful teacher, uh, wonderful teaching. And I'm using wonder in the, the literal sense, right? Um, and we'll talk about the, the definition of that in just a moment. Do you, do you remember your favorite teacher? How many people here remember your absolute favorite teacher? Ha, huh. wow, okay, that's what I thought. Why, why do we remember that person, right? That's the question, why do we remember that person? Well, when you, I remember Mr. Keir being one of my all time favorite teachers. I hated history. Eighth grade, I got Mr. Keir and I thought, oh, you know, I'll be able to sleep or uh, this is gonna be awful. Mr. Keir loved history. He exuded his passion for it. I, at the end of eighth grade, I loved history and I still love it. And I owe that to Mr. Keir. So this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. If he were a computer, I have never gotten anything I loved <laughs> from a computer. Maybe a recipe that was really good that my wife has made for me. I, I love the recipe or something like that. But nothing ever comes close to that via computer. All right, that's why computers are teaching tools. So it is passion and enthusiasm are contagious. And if you come to your teaching uh, with your child at home for homeschooling, or if you're a teacher here, and many of you are, if you can bring this to it, it makes all the difference in the world, among other things. And we'll discuss the other things as well. And of course, if you have your children at home, which I think the majority of us, how many people here, raise hands, are homeschooling? Okay, yeah, that looks like just about all of us. Wow, okay. So this is your opportunity to make your children, your child or children, love learning. So much so that, you know, I noticed as students go through school, by the time they're in high school, a lot of them just hate school. They can't wait to get out. The love of learning is beaten out of us because we have, you know, the schools are in a bind. They have to teach the test. You have to pass the test to get money. It's awful. It's not anything education should be. But you have an opportunity here that they don't you have the opportunity to, to change your child's life. And this is fun. So wonderful teaching also, and I wanna just discuss this in, in uh, relationship to discipline, right? Because a lot of you, how many people here had a real problem working with your own child, at least to start? How many people had a real problem? Yeah, it's different, isn't it? when all of a sudden you're not only parent, but you're teacher, right? And you have them at home and they're driving you out of your mind, all right? This is Jay Krishnamurti, brilliant philosopher, said discipline means to learn, not to conform, not to suppress, not to imitate. So this is the very, so this very learning is its own discipline. So he related the word discipline to the word disciple. And it is highly related. The word discipline, the root of it is disciple. Someone who studies, someone who follows and studies, a disciple. So if we can get them to where they are learning and they are engaged, we don't worry about discipline. The craziness, the amount of uh, angst, the amount of 
um, negative energy between the two of you will dissipate. But this is key, all right? All of these things will come in and it's like uh, a building a house. Each piece, one, you build a solid foundation, you build the rest of your house. So remember, discipline becomes minor when you get them engaged and you get them to be part of this. So wonder is the rapt attention or astonishment at something awesomely mysterious or new to one's experience causing curiosity, all right? So rapt attention or astonishment at something awesomely mysterious or new to one's experience causing curiosity. Now, one of the things that computers do and that TV does is they pretty much squash mystery, right? If you watch TV, then they explain everything. Nothing mysterious about it, as if we know everything. The awesomeness of things is usually just squashed because they have to, you know, fill the time. One of the, uh, I think one of the things that you can, uh, or, or actual shows that are, is on TV that is most popular is Shark Week. Is everyone here familiar with Shark Week or some of you familiar with Shark Week on Discovery? All right, a few of us are, are familiar with Shark Week. Okay, sharks are awesome and they are incredibly powerful and they are mysterious because we never see them until it's too late and they dwell in places we don't dwell. There's a lot of mystery and we still don't know everything about great white sharks. We don't know everything about sharks, period. So when, when Shark Week ha happens, we all tune in because we want to be part of that wonder. We want to see it and they explain a lot to us, but then they are honest with us and say, there's a lot we just don't know, all right? That's what you must do. This is wonder. When I talk about wonderful teaching, I'm not just saying, oh, you're going to be wonderful as a teacher. I'm going, I'm, I'm asking you, when you create a plan, that you put wonder into it, mystery into it, engagement into it, that just brings out their curiosity. Because when you bring out their curiosity, you tend to have great discipline. You have them engaged. They want to learn. They'll pick up things so quickly that you never imagined. And these are the keys to doing it. Fun is what provides amusement or enjoyment. All right? We can mesh these two. We can mesh both wonder and fun just to have a great time. Because if you're having a great time, they'll be having a great time, right? If you're in a fight, they're the other half of the fight, and we just don't want that. No learning takes place, just conflict. So we do want to make certain that we provide wonder, we provide curiosity, and we make this fun. So here's what you as the teachers will contribute. And if you are unaware of any of this, um, we can, you know, this, what I'm doing today probably should take about three days. So we're condensing it. So if I haven't covered everything you want to know, or maybe we just need to chat again, maybe we'll do another one of these and we can all share our ideas because I bet you some of you out there have some ideas that are absolutely fantastic and we could share them as a community. I'd be delighted to do that. We'll bring that up at the end as well. Here's what you as teacher will contribute, right? You have to have a depth and breadth of knowledge. If you're not familiar with the curriculum that you're helping, you're assisting with, you really need to study up on it. Take some time in the evening and study up on it. The more that you understand, and this is one of the mistakes we make in education, we separate math from science, science from history, history from civics. We just separate everything. And then it happens even even worse at university. Everybody comes out as a specialist in something. We don't have a depth and breadth of knowledge of much of anything anymore, but we're specialists in a certain area, which is a huge mistake because math is greatly related to science. 
Science is greatly related to history. History is greatly related to government. It's all related. Yet we break them apart as if they're entirely separate. When, and when your kids try to apply things and they think, well, why am I doing this, right? How many times have you, again, hands up, how many times have your children looked at you, why am I learning this? Why, I don't get it. Why am I learning this stuff? I'm never going to use it. Anyone here heard that? That's because we're not giving them context. We just throw it at them. It's like, kind of like when you make spaghetti. <laughs> if it's ready, we throw it against the wall, and if it sticks, it's good. But that's not the way to teach. That's the worst way to teach, because if they don't have context, they don't understand, they don't like to learn that way. They don't like that because they ask you, why am I doing this? It's a waste of time. I'm bored, right? If it's in context and you can bring it into context, which is one of our goals today, then you'll see how we can make this all make sense. Have a good time, provide wonder, get excitement going, get enthusiasm going, and you become a great teacher and someone that you're child not only looks to as a parent, but understands that you are a teacher. Because all of us here, all of us here are teachers, and we have a great teacher inside. We just have to pull it out, figure out how to do that. And that's what we're going to do today. So you have to have the depth and breadth. Study a little bit. If you're not aware of the material you're going to have to present, study it. Study it in context, not just math, but where does this math fit in history? Where did it come from? How is it used? Where do they apply it? Know that. That's not too hard to do. Enthusiasm. If you can't tell that I love talking to you today, then you, I've, mi I've missed my goal because this is near and dear to my heart. I have taught, uh, in, I have taught in public education. I have taught uh, police defensive tactics. I have taught martial arts. Martial arts I have taught for 50 almost 50 years now, on top of regular education. I love it. I love the idea and how to make it better, how to, how to make my students better. If I plan for fun, and you can't just hope that fun's going to happen. I plan for fun. How do I make this fun, right? And I'll talk about this when we actually uh, show the concepts that I want you to try to, to use. I'll talk to you about how we make this fun, all right? Provide lessons of wonder. If you tell me something that I already know, then I just go, yeah, I know. How many of you have heard that? Yeah, I know that. I know, right? And then you're frustrated and they're frustrated. What if we take them to the edge we know what they already know, and this is important. I understand them as a human being. I understand my student as a person individually. So I take them to the edge of what they do and do not know. And they're at the edge of what they do and do not know. What lies out there? Can anyone tell me? It's mystery. If I take them to the edge of what they do know, but also what they don't know, that's mystery. And that's what keeps them engaged, all right? So that's how we provide lessons of wonder. Experiential learning, put it in context, get their hands on it so that they're doing something, not skill and drill using worksheets. By the way, that's not teaching, all right? That's practice, but that's not teaching. When we need some of that, we'll have to do some of that. That's called skill and drill, right? It's like practicing layups if you're a, uh, basketball player, right? Or free throws. It's skill and drill. It's not teaching me anything. I, I'm trying to perfect the technique, but it's not necessarily teaching me new, new things. Your imaginations, your ma imagination and your child's imagination, you will come together to have an exciting time together. During this period where it seems like it's going to be like a root canal, it's actually going to be fun if you do this. Challenge. Again, this is kind of related to wonder. I want to challenge them to go to the extent of what they already know, and then we'll take them over that precipice in the mystery so that they can 
engage and discover on their own. And finally, we'll use deliberate practice. Now, deliberate practice, if you're not familiar with it, is a term you should become familiar with. I, I, I would ask that you look this up online. Uh, Anders Ericsson, University of Central Florida, <clears throat> is the guru of deliberate practice. He spent years trying to decode how people get to be really good at what they do. He looked at uh, everything <clears throat> from figure skaters, Olympic figure skaters, to professionals, to athletes, other athletes. Um, and what he found was, is that if we do the same thing over and over again, it doesn't make us any better. And that's typically what people do. I'll do something that I do pretty well and I'll practice it. If any of you are in martial arts or tennis or golf, I often see it in golfers. Golfers will go out and they'll hit a bucket, bucket of balls and they come back in and they play around after that. They try to play nine holes. They go, I still am awful. My shot stinks. I don't know why I hit the bucket of balls. Well, if you hit the bucket of balls the same way you've been hitting a bucket of balls for the last 10 years and you expect something new to happen, not going to happen. Deliberate practice is practicing with little goals that you can uh, achieve. It's in, when I developed play attention, um, we used challenge and deliberate practice as a model for it. So when we um, were doing this, it made certain that people learn on a higher rate, faster rate, and they learn quicker. So deliberate practice means setting little goals and achieving them and just at the edge of what I'm good at so that I'm constantly improving. So if you haven't uh, uh, understood what deliberate practice is, look it up, become familiar with it because we'll definitely want to use it. So this is huge and that's why I left a whole slide to it. The integration of subject matter is paramount. All right, so remember when I talked about math being separate from science, math being separate from history, science being separate from history, we all just break them apart and we say, okay, uh, we're going to learn this about someone today. It's so abstract, they could care less. But what if it's related to something that's important to me? Then I'm eager to learn. So this is what I need you to do is not just be uh, of the mindset that, um, that I have to have knowledge only in math to teach math. If you're teaching math well, then you have now you have you can bring cooking knowledge, you can bring science into it, you can bring history into it. They're all related. So I need you to be able to not just look at this as little pieces of a pie. We're talking about putting the whole pie together, which is the integration of subject matter. So in wonderful teaching, what I I really don't want you to do is lecture, all right? If you looked at lecturing, um, which is what, if any of us here, how many people have been to university, right? Hands raised, all right. So how did they teach at university? Most of the time, you get a lecture. You don't even get a PowerPoint. You get a lecture. So they stand up, they write things on the chalkboard, and it's supposed to go into your brain. So lecturing, and this is what they did to me at university as an educator, for the most part, I got lectured to, and it was awful. Lecturing is the least effective method of teaching, yet at university, universities oftentimes don't have really good teachers. They have smart people who are professors, but they don't know how to teach. That's a problem. So what, they, what do they do? Well, they do what they were taught. Their professors lecture to them, so they lecture and they write. Don't do it. It just is terrible. So you will find that you end up in a fight. You end up, especially if you're dealing with younger children. By high school, a lot of the kids are used to like getting lectures, but it is the worst way of teaching. So if you're giving a lecture, it is scraping the bottom of the barrel for method. Don't do it. 
don't use skill and drill as a teaching tool. All right. Remember, skill and drill is practice. It is not teaching. Teaching teaches them how to do what they're going to do in the drill and skill. But drill, drill and skill is not a teaching, it is not teaching someone. It is practicing. And practicing is a little bit different. All right. So let's make certain that we are aware uh, that we will use it. We have to use it because skill and drill is necessary, not a great deal of fun. But if you've gotten the other half of enthusiasm, of wonderful teaching, then they'll do this and they'll do it quickly and effectively. All right. But don't use it as a teaching. It's, it is not teaching. Don't put the paper in front of them and say, go at it. They're not going to learn it and they'll end up hating you and they may despise you and you may have found that out already. Don't read the book and answer the questions and think that that's teaching. It's not. Again, it's more practice and what we call reinforcement. All right, skill and drill and reading the book and answering the questions are reinforcers. But in order for it to have meaning, I have to get them to the point where it has context, it has meaning. You're not doing it just because I'm the teacher, I said you'll do this. Well, how much did you learn when someone told you that? If you did, you learned it for a day or two, you, and then it just went out of your mind. The test time came and you were probably struggling, all right? Don't think that you're limited to a textbook because you're not. You have the whole world as your oyster. You have the whole world that you can use as a teaching aid. Everything around you, grab it and use it as a teaching aid. Okay, this is super important as well. Let me get my picture off of this. What you as teachers should know, all right? How do most students learn best? And particularly if you're teaching at home, you need to know this. You may, you perhaps you already know it. <clears throat> Is your student, your child, you know, and you may have several. Let's say you've got Billy, Jenna, and uh, Alice. Is Billy an auditory learner? Does he learn because you say something and he is good to go and understands these directions and can do it, picks it up through his ear. Is Jenna a visual learner? Does she have to see you do something so that she can do it? I'm very visual. If I see you do it and I see it two or three times, oftentimes I can learn it. And then martial arts, that was super important. Is Alice an experiential learner? Is she, can, does she have to have her hands on it, get involved, make something? Is she, like our, our young lady right here, is she a reading, writing expert? Loves to read, loves to write. Is that her, her strong suit? Is that her fort? And then are any of your children combinations of these? Do they do well with, uh, experiential and auditory and visual. So know what this is, right? Just watch them. The best way to learn it about your child is to watch. How many of you ever, have ever taken that time to understand what type of learner your child is? All right. Okay, great. Some of us have actually taken the time to learn it. So you know how, what they like. So what we're going to do is offer them all of this so that they have their hands on it, so that they have a highly auditory experience, a highly visual experience, something that's going to ask them to read and write and be very, very experiential. And we'll combine it because we know when we do that, we hit everything. All right. So now let's talk about wonderful teaching concepts. These are things for you to use. <clears throat> So remember I told you about my classroom being a place where the kids actually came in uh, and then we simply went to work, right? I took a lunch count to notify the cafeteria of what were, you know, how many students would be buying lunch, um, head count uh, for absenteeism. Then the rest of the time they went to work. They went to the newsroom, 
They went to the movie studio. We had crime scene investigation. We had Raiders of the Lost Ark, which was really my archaeology team. And we had a NASA division, among other things, in the classroom. So everyone had a job. All right. There was nothing about a textbook. If they needed the textbook, the textbook was there as well as the library. And of course, at that time, we were using Mac 2Es. I don't know if you are old enough to remember those. I am older uh, than probably most everyone here. And a Mac 2E was an, uh, a Macintosh 2E was a terrible little computer that you used to stick those little floppy disks in. You could play uh, Oregon Trail, which is really <laughs> a funny video game in those days, you know. I always ended up dead on the Oregon Trail. All right. So we had those, but I had to make it uh, creative and fun. So let's see what we did in the newsroom, all right? For wonderful teaching. We create a real newsroom. You can do this right at home. Look at how to create the set. Just creating the set is a lesson in itself. Let's say that we're creating the sets so that we have maybe this great uh, logo in the back because we can now broadcast our news. We can broadcast our news over Zoom for free to grandma and grandpa, to our friends. This is news that we've collected. Could be news in the neighborhood. Could be news about what's happening in your home. It could be news from anywhere in the planet that we've gotten off the web, off of TV. And we create this model like this, our, our backdrop, breaking the news. Uh, when we do this, this requires measurement. This requires planning. This requires graphics knowledge. This requires us to be able to work together as a team. Now that's just the front end of it in creating this little backdrop. So we're all engaged and I might ask them, if I go to my kids and said, look, we're gonna set up a newsroom at home. What do we need to do to set up a newsroom, right? If we do it, then they're already engaged at that point. And you can ask, anyone here interested in helping me? Because I'd love to do it. I'd love to do our own news broadcast. And you'll have, and we, we get a, a, you know, a cheap microphone you can get off of Amazon for $20 and do interviews with people. So what does that involve? Well, there is a huge amount of reading and writing involved, right? I need to read uh, the latest uh, uh, news off of the internet, maybe watch videos. I need to write down a script for the broadcaster. I need to, if I am the broadcaster, I need to learn how to professionally broadcast because there is an art to it. I actually trained with people. One of the first things they taught me was that if I had a suit jacket on, they said, when you sit down in front of the camera, pull the back of your jacket down. How many people here have ever watched uh, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, NBC News? You've watched it and you see this professional on the screen and he's sitting in front and his suit jacket is hiked up way above his head. All right, it seems like something minor, but they've never been trained. So there, there is a, a certain amount of training that goes into being in front of a camera. And we can actually create cue cards, which is more reading and writing. We have to learn how to interview. All right, there is some interviewing skill. There are some interviewing skills that are actually crucial to getting answers out of people that we need. Otherwise, your interview is boring. We have to train how to do that. There is math involved in being in the newsroom. How many hours are we working today? How many minutes is this broadcast? You can break, start breaking this down like crazy. How many minutes, how many seconds, how many tenths of seconds are we doing this segment so that we can fit this all into a time frame. We're not going to have a newscast that takes three hours. We're going to put it into this time frame. So there's math involved. You can make math lessons out of this to know it, but it's all part of the newsroom. Is there science involved? Is there history involved? If a person has a story, then typically math, science, and history are all in there somewhere, right? If someone is telling you that uh, they uh, know someone that actually uh, just came back from uh, a hot spot. They, they traveled up from Florida. 
and uh, well, what's the history behind that? What is the history? What is their family? Is their family down there? Where are their family uh, from? What's the background on there? So we're starting to learn a little history of that. And what's the history of the area they were in? So we start to learn geography. We start to learn about the, the United States. And this is just something I'm coming up with in a minor sense. You could, you know, if you have family that is finally allowed to travel and they want to talk about, and you interview them over Zoom and they're from uh, South America, they're from Europe, they're from Africa, they're from Asia, they're from Australia. You have a lot of things that can be added in. So there's a lot of research. The challenge for you to challenge them is to take them to the limits of what they already know and bring them a little step further. Because remember, if I challenge them, I take them to the limits of what they're able to do, and there's something mysterious or something new that I have to learn out there, that's wonder. That's where you engage them. That's where you pull this all together. So you have to study up. If you're doing a TV newsroom, you should study up on this. Know your plan. Devise a plan. Put it together and see how the math, science, and history that they're responsible for under the curriculum that's been advanced to them. This is how we actually learn how to uh, do it together and how to integrate the curriculum. So far, making sense? At the end of this, I'm going to... Uh, take questions from you in the chat section. So, uh, and we'll talk about the questions. So if you can uh, say, keep your questions in mind and then we'll talk about them at the end. Another one was a movie studio that we had. Uh, and here's what I did in, in class. In, at the time I was teaching, Russia was a focus. We had to learn Russian history. I think this was sixth, sixth grade. Um, so, when we were studying Russian history, I didn't have to sit there and lecture Russian history. I said, you know what would be really cool, guys, is that we do a movie on Russian history. And uh, it was fantastic because we had a crew that did scripts. We had a crew that did storyboards. If you're not familiar with storyboards, every movie is mapped out with a storyboard. So on one side of the storyboard, if you're not familiar with it, look it up so you can see how storyboards are done. But essentially, you have a rough up, you have the, the dialogue on this side, and then you have a, a, a draft, a usually hand-drawn uh, picture of the scene that you want for that, and some description of how the camera will move. You can see there's a tremendous amount involved here. This is how I want this done. So I storyboard. Does this involve executive function? You bet. They have to reason, they have to plan, they have to keep their impulses down, they have to use their mind to make certain everything gets planned out correctly and I'm able to uh, implement it correctly. I have one of them who's the director, one who's a producer, one's a script writer. We all work together on this. Math, science, and history. When we did the uh, history of Russia, I could involve it all because they had plenty of science going. They had plenty of history, violent history, all right? Math was involved because some of the leaders in math were Russians at that time, right? And a ton of research happening to get this done. We're integrating everything into this one thing. They have no idea I'm integrating it, none at all, because to them, they're just having a ball. So far, so good, makes sense? We'll keep going. Another one, crime scene investigation, all right? What if I presented a situation to them in my classroom about something that happened? There was a robbery or a murder, all right? And the, the murder is kind of like, uh, oh, what's that game? Clue, right? Uh, you know, was it Colonel Mustard in the kitchen? You try to make it as lighthearted as possible. We do investigation. We have to go to the scene, pick out clues. It's a robbery. What happened in that room, right? And I would set up a closet or something um, where they could 
actually go in, take pictures, they could write notes, they could plan on what had happened. There's math because they have to measure all kinds of distances where I would put fake bullet holes in the wall. So there's math involved in measurement and fractions and decimals. Um, in science, uh, obviously crime scene investigation, how do we use science to figure these things out? And we would share with each other ideas so that we could use science to how, you know, I taught them how to take fingerprints using uh, a little bit of uh, toner powder that came out of an old uh, discarded toner and some scotch tape. So I showed them how to take fingerprints, which is for them huge. For me, it was easy, but to integrate all of this was a fantastic lesson. And this, these lessons can take as long as you want them to take because you can add to them, right? You can, you can keep augmenting them a little bit. Research and challenge in here. Raiders of the Lost Ark. My archaeologists, I would go outside and I would find some old stuff in the basement or the attic and I'd bury it. And then I would give them some history on some of the people that, I, that these things might have come from. And then we would try to discern uh, what period of time, where they could have come from on the globe um, using math, science, history, research. Uh, the actual getting outside and digging in the dirt was a blast. And all of this involves adventure. And I could make it as much like Indiana Jones as I wanted to. Because if the more imagination, the more excitement you add to it, the more mystery, the more they love it. The last one here was NASA. So we actually made rockets. So making, we made rockets out of paper towel tubes and we, and I bought engines for them. The engines are, you know, they're relatively inexpensive and a launch pad. And we set these things off and we had people and we used instruments we made in the classroom to measure how high they went. All right. So there's math, planning, science, research. We got to discuss black holes, our galaxy, our solar system, universe. So teaching the solar system was part of that. And so instead of me just saying, well, you know, there are other planets and this is the sun. And, you know, that's, I had them move the movie team, develop a movie for it. And so you could go into this huge box in the classroom, two of us at a time. And we could watch the movie and take a journey through space that the movie crew presented. And the whole, all of it was research written by everyone contributing. All right. And then shooting off rockets, going outside and shooting off rockets was a major event. Most of the school came out to watch. The local newspaper always came to film it because the kids made them. We'd even use pieces of garbage bag cut up and they would pop out a chute at the end and the rocket would come down safely. Now, if you don't think we had a blast in doing all of these things and they were learning, obviously when my kids come out at the end of the school year, we didn't use much of the textbook unless it was research and we needed it. And they came out in the 90, 17 out of 28, 99th percentile. The remainder over two years of progress within that year from where they came in two years jump. So if they were at a fourth grade level, when they came to me in sixth grade, they were graduated at sixth grade level, which was a quantum leap for those kids that did not make it to the 99th percentile. I hope you see the value in doing this. Summary. Remember your favorite teacher, because if he or she put their heart into teaching and made it fun and challenged me, took me to my limits and then pushed me over the edge into that mystery and wonder category, they remained in my heart. The primary aim of education is to teach them how to think and reason. Because if we teach them how to think and reason, then learning about uh, culture, uh, learning how to be a good citizen, about values, about vocation, and about knowledge, it's all in there. But in order to do that, I have to be able to think and reason. That's got to be a primary aim. 
learning and discipline are highly related. Imagine if when you're getting your classroom together, imagine that they are engaged. And if they are engaged, I don't worry about people getting angry. We may get into an occasional fuss and a disagreement, but then we learn how to reason that out and settle it. But it's not, they're not fighting with me over learning. They're having a blast learning. Make sense? Lecturing is the least effective method. I've tried to lecture as little as possible, but just explain uh, what I had done so that you have a story. We love, human beings love stories. Our brain acts as a storyteller. Most of the memories that we have, our long, longer memories, are not very accurate. They are recycled in our memory system over and over, so they're not very accurate. Um, this is because the memories are, sto are stored as pictures and stories. They're stored main, uh, as pictures and we tell stories about them, all right? But lecture lecturing is basically the least effective method. Try not to do it. Remember, drill and skill, we got to do, we got to practice, but it's not teaching. It's just reinforcement. Your imagination is the key. The more imaginative, imaginative you are, the more fun they're going to have. You engage them to help you to do this, and they're part of it, you're going to have a blast. I can guarantee you, you will have fun. Set your stage. Start planning and set the stage to make this happen. It's not going to happen spontaneously. Set the stage to make it happen. And integrate your subject matter. Don't let them know. They don't have to know. Just say, well, here's... I need this measured. And if this happens this way, how much is that going to cost us? And then you are tying in math and make, you can tie that in in many, many different ways. All right. Uh, of course, we're going to just briefly talk about play attention here. Play, remember, play attention uses all of these things. That's why we developed it, because it's a superior way to, turn, uh, to teach. Uh, upcoming events, Monday mornings at 11 a.m., Facebook and Zoom live coffee break to discuss homeschooling topics. Matter of fact, I'll ask Gwen, who does those, to talk about what we talked about today, all right, so that she can help reinforce for you um, what we had talked about. Uh, next Thursday, there's a Play Attention webinar on Neuroplasticity 101. That's next Thursday. Uh, in September, we have Executive Function 101 courses uh, and activities to enhance your school year. You can sign up for those, I believe, on the Play Attention web website. If you need to talk about your child, and if your child is ADHD, autism, um, and so forth, you know, problems with uh, learning and executive function, get a free consultation. <coughs> Excuse me. My throat is getting dry from yakking so much. Um, Get a free consultation so they can help you and guide you through. That's their 800 number right there. And I'm going to put up my uh, chat right now because I know people had some questions. So if you do have questions, please do um, and uh, send them in and I'll do my best to answer them. Yolanda asks, uh, hi, I work uh, home based and I have at the same time to coach, assist and teach my third year uh, a three-year-old uh, daughter, ADHD daughter. The recommendations and ideas sound great if I could prepare myself and dedicate only to work, but truly that is not my case. How do I do my best engaging uh, my child and creating joy and learning for dealing with my real life challenges? So you wanna make certain that you don't involve them in your, your challenges. As an adult, we wanna keep that separate. You, if, if you are home-based and, and working, you can still do what I'm talking about. It is not a full-time profession for you. Set a stage so that you can take a couple of hours for your daughter. You absolutely have to if you're going to be homeschooling. Can't neglect it. Take a couple of hours to do some of this. It takes maybe an hour of your evening time to study a little bit, 
so that you can set the stage. Remember I said set the stage. And then just do a few things. You don't have to do an extravaganza. We're not making a huge movie. We're just doing some things that tie things together and have fun, okay? I do not want my daughter to be eager to learn. I do want my daughter to be eager to learn, but she does not show signs of engaging. Anything will be a distraction for her. So you have to find out, and this is a really good question, Yolanda. You have to find out what tickles her fancy. What is she motivated in? If she is a third, uh, three-year-old uh, daughter, right, or third year, I, I think you mean three-year-old daughter. If she's a three-year-old, does she love unicorns? Does she love trolls? Does she love dolls? Does she love carpentry? Does she love beekeeping? Find out what she loves. And then that's how you enter her heart. Find out what she is passionate about. You'll find out. I'm certain you already know, right? And then if she, you do, you approach it like that. Really good question. And I know I am laying so much on everyone. Um, so, but I, I, and I apologize because we have a very short amount of time. Um, Jean uh, asks, uh, gifted with severe ADHD, 10 year old addicted to Minecraft, scratch, anything on screen. So make a movie, how to keep attention. So, uh, so make a move, how to keep attention. All right, Gene, one of the things you need to be aware of um, is that Minecraft is highly addicting. And uh, for an ADHD kid, they, their whole world can revolve around that. So uh, first things first, make certain you're limiting the amount of time he's playing Minecraft. Really anything like that, you know, video games um, need to be limited. Treat them like you would treat dessert, all right? Dessert is great if I have a little bit of it at a time, but if I'm sitting there eating dessert for two or three hours at a time, it's no good for anyone. Minecraft is the same way. For the brain, it's very rewarding and tasty, like dessert. Limit the amount of time. So find out, perhaps, if you use Minecraft, right, you use that as leverage. As and I typically would say this to students who had problems, uh, you know, engaging. I would say, look, you want to do that? I will let you do that for as much time as you offer me to do this. So they had a choice, right? But definitely limit the amount of time that uh, they're playing those video games. It actually contributes to decreased attention. And that's, these are studies that have been ongoing for years. Um, and uh, Alina, who's an educator that works with us, said there are Minecraft lessons online. Uh, so if you look up Minecraft lessons, then you'll be able to find it. But still limit the time on Minecraft. All right. All right. So Yolanda said, well, she's going to be eight going into third grade. Okay. Perfect, Yolanda. Find out. And uh, I know I threw a lot at you at one time. Should we do a follow-up with each other? Should you try some of these things? Have a good time, success or failure, try something. And should we follow up with each other? Should we do this again so that we can all get back here and uh, talk about this? If anyone's interested in doing that, uh, raise your hand and then we can go over what you've done and, um, and then know whether or not we uh, really should uh, give you more help because we threw a lot at you in a very short amount of time. A lot of people raise their hands. Okay, so if you want, let's meet in another two weeks. And then um, I will basically just take your questions at that point. And I would hope you'll provide to me and the rest of the people in this community exactly what you did, right? Because if we're sharing it among each other, then your ideas will be someone else goes, oh man, I wish I thought about that. And that makes this just a lot easier. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? We all contribute. Right. And that way it makes it easier for anyone else. All right. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions um, at all before we stop the webinar? All right. I'm assuming that's a no. I just wanted to thank you so much for joining me. And I really appreciate it. And I hope that you can try some of these things to make your teaching wonderful and fun. I'm Peter Freer. We will see you again in two weeks. Take care.